Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and welcome to So Wrong It's Right. This is a panel show that stares ugly malfunction in the face, just like my bathroom mirror. <laughs> they say failure is not an option, which is true, unless you're filling out a questionnaire on popular opinions of Nick Clegg, in which case it's the option between idiot and Judas. <laughs> No one's perfect, anyone is capable of human error, apart from Piers Morgan, obviously, who makes mistakes on behalf of whatever life form he's supposed to represent. <laughs> I think it's some form of possessed poultry. <laughs> they say we feel happier if we surround ourselves with failure, and I couldn't be happier to introduce tonight's guests. Uh, comic Josie Long, comic writer Dan Meyer, and comic reader Frank Skinner. <laughs> The first round is called Wrong Time, Wrong Place. It's an autobiographical round in which I'll be asking my guests to mine their pasts in a bid to out-wrong each other with stories from their own disgusting and rather meaningless little lives. Uh, I don't want to judge, but I have. <laughs> this week, I've asked them to tell me about the worst thing that's ever happened to them in public. Now, according to surveys, lots of people are terrified of public speaking. I know how they feel. I can't bear the public speaking or even just looking at me. <laughs> Which is why I'm faintly disgusted even now. Um, there are things we do in private that we'd never do in public. I let my emotions out. I cry. I talk to myself. And sometimes I even walk around naked. But in private, I just stare at the walls. <laughs> Frank Skinner, what is the worst thing that's happened to you in public? Well, it was actually before I became, um, what I'll say for the purposes of this show, is, is a public figure. I was, um, I was waiting for a boss in Birmingham. And I'd recently um, had to start wearing glasses, little tiny round national health glasses. I had an orange hat that I'd bought um, on a day trip to a Rill, you know, you know, on a flight of fancy. <laughs> I had a beard in those days as well, so picture me if, if you can. And I got on the, the bus and it was very crowded. And then at the next stop, a woman got on with two small children in school uniforms from the local posh school, public school that was there. And they came and sat by me and she sat at the front. And I was chewing gum. Stick with this. And one of them, <laughs> one of them said to me, what have you got in your mouth? And I said, well, I'm, I'm chewing gum. And he said, could I have some? And I said, well, you know, your, your mummy might not like you having chewing gum, so no. And uh, he said, mummy, and called the whole length of the bus. And she said, yes, dear. And he said, could I have some chewing gum? And she said, I don't have any, dear. And he said, this man says he'll give us some. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone on the bus looked round. And... A muttering went off, which I, the tone of which I can only describe as accusatory. <laughs> and I actually got off at the next stop, even though it was about two miles from my house. <laughs> did you, I mean, what did you, did you try and disguise yourself immediately, ripping clumps of beard off at the next stop? Well, the trouble is, once you've got a uh, hat, glasses and a beard, disguise doesn't really seem like... Not... <laughs> You're Matt, your honour is the of... case for the defence. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a fairly harrowing tale. Josie, Josie Long, what is your, what's the most appalling thing that's occurred to you in public? See, mine doesn't seem as bad now. Um, it's just, when I was 12, I called my biology teacher... Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to say, I was on a bus and this guy... <laughs> <laughs> this this guy offered me some chewing gum. Yeah, offered me some chewing gum. Um, no, when I was 12, I called my biology teacher Masherie, like the French for my darling, in a class. Why? Because there was sort of some discussion going on where they were talking about, like, French pet names that people had, and I got it confused with mon chou, which means, like, my cabbage, or something, which is less... Well, that would have made a lot more sense. Yeah, well, that would have been less embarrassing, but it looked like I was being all kind of coquettish. And then for six years afterwards, people would kind of allude to it. What, like, she's the one who likes the biology <laughs> teacher? <laughs> so that was what, pretty bad. What was the immediate aftermath? How did the teacher handle it? Did he diffuse the anxiety? No! Oh, well. We went out for four years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. What, you just left the class there waiting? <laughs> It is embarrassing when you accidentally use a, a term like that. I remember going to, when I was a student, one of my friend's mothers held a sort of summer garden party. And I went along to it, and I'm just a bit socially awkward. I didn't know quite what to say at the end. To say goodbye, do I just sort of 
peck her on the cheek? Do I shake her hand? I didn't know what to do. All I knew I had to say was that the food was delicious and give her some sort of, you know, affectionate goodbye. And what I ended up doing was I accidentally kissed her on the mouth <laughs> and said, mmm, delicious. <laughs> um, <laughs> And ended up going out with her for four years. <laughs> and then I had to get in the car with my friends who were all going, what the hell? What are you doing? Uh, so I can, I can share your pain uh, with that. Uh, Dan, what's your catastrophe? Uh, it's going back to when I was about 16 or 17. I was in uh, Newcastle Town Centre. That's not it. There's, there's more. Uh, and I had an epileptic fit. Right, I know, it's comedy platinum already, isn't it? <laughs> I had suffered uh, with epilepsy during my teenage years, right? This was kind of the last one that I'd, uh, it turned out that I ever had. And I came to, uh, lying on a street corner in the middle of Newcastle, looked up and there's kind of a ring of faces looking down at me and I just felt really embarrassed. Now, obviously, epilepsy itself, that's fine. There shouldn't be any stigma attached to that. I'm not suggesting anyone should be embarrassed about that. It's fine. But unfortunately, one of the sort of strange effects having the seizures had on me was that for sort of 15 or 20 minutes afterwards, I couldn't speak the connection between my brain and my mouth was scrambled. So uh, my brain was working fine, but no words would come out of my mouth. So it's kind of like the opposite of being Jeremy Kyle, if you can <laughs> imagine. Like that. It's sort of like being on a date. <laughs> so, so, yeah. What's coming out of my mouth is... Nah. <laughs> and then I heard a, a, a lad saying, Oh, I reckon they send me goes to our school. I thought, oh, great, that's, that's no, that's very well. Because <laughs> obviously schoolboys are the most empathetic of all peer groups. <laughs> Uh, and I thought, this really can't get any worse. Uh, it did, though, because somebody called an ambulance. <laughs> they take me to the hospital, and then the topper is that, unfortunately, the place where I'd actually had the seizure was about 100 metres away from the hospital. <laughs> so it was like the most pathetic ambulance journey. <laughs> it's a bit like when you get in a taxi and you go just not far enough to have justified getting a taxi, You've, but yes. with sirens. <laughs> <laughs> So that's still, I think that's, I still carry the scars from that afternoon. I think the amazing thing about that is that someone incomprehensible lying on a pavement in Newcastle still gathers a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I was wearing a coat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'll have them point in every time. Now, that's a poignant story, isn't it? That just blows your two stories out yeah, of the water. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit unfair. I think Dan's played his epilepsy card. <laughs> Um, well, I would say that of those tales, Dan has played the, the epileptic card, <laughs> cynically. I um, feel but... a bit dirty now and soiled. Yeah. yeah. Disgusting. It's a point to you. You cheat. <laughs> um, our next round is called Do Your Worst, in which I'll be asking each of my guests to pitch me an awful idea of their own conception. This week, I've asked them to come up with a terrible idea for a chain of shops. Celebrity chefs can earn a fortune by letting a big chain supermarket use their face. Waitrose use Delia Smith's face. Sainsbury's use Jamie Oliver's face. And by the looks of it, Morrison's use Gordon Ramsay's face to mop up shattered jam jars <laughs> in aisle five. <laughs> Josie. Josie Long. What's your idea for a terrible chain of shops? The idea that I had is called reverse Argos. Basically, you show up with a thing that you already have that you do use and need, like a mop. Just, you know, anything. <laughs> anything you buy in Argos. An orange hat. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Right, you show up with that, and then you have to queue for about 45 minutes at a kind of booth that leads to the warehouse, and you give it to a person, and they give you a little chit, and then you have to queue for about half an hour to go to a cashier where you feed your chit into a machine and then you have to go to a, a catalogue where you look at... It's just reversed. <laughs> and then at the end, you have nothing and you've spent three hours queuing. And it's even worse than that because you no longer have an item that you did use and need. Why would anyone... <laughs> I, I, the brief was come up with the worst idea for a chain of shops. I mean, the only thing worse than that is just work. a shop that punches you in the face. <laughs> what the my, hell? my one oh, could my. do that as well. <laughs> What's so bad though? It's quite a nice, it it's takes... a nice concept, isn't it? It's good. Yeah, you don't... I always think of Argos as the Chav Library. <laughs> <laughs> None of those people. That's the only books they ever handle. <laughs> I quite like the experience of going into it. I, it's mainly because the first time I went in... You know, sometimes they got some items on display. And genuinely, I went in and saw Brian May from Queen looking at... What, on display? Yeah. 
<laughs> page 738 in the catalogue. <laughs> no, Members of was, Queen. He was handling um, hair dryers. You know when hair dryers <laughs> got those big diffuser things? He was genuinely standing. It was like he was on a display. It was, I was so impressed that I saw Brian May doing something you wouldn't imagine he'd have done on Spitting Image. <laughs> I, I like the bit where you sit in the plastic seating and, and, and really, is... you really stare at the people behind the counter. It's like a very, very poor theatre. <laughs> <laughs> and they can get quite self-conscious, especially when you don't get up for your thing when it comes, <laughs> because you, you, your mind's been taken by the, these people. Um, OK, so, Dan, what's so, your... So, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I like these, you know, the, the cash for gold concessions that you sort of get in shopping malls and things. I think that's quite a good model. So, built on that, I am proposing uh, Cash for Kids. <laughs> where you uh, turn your unwanted kids into cash. It's basically as simple as that. Because um, everybody's got one they don't really need, haven't they? Really... <laughs> Lying around the house somewhere, I think that would... So, do you take them into a, a shopping mall, or, or do you just post them in? in a I think sort you of could perforated... possibly stick them in a jiffy bag, but possibly <laughs> a chain of shops. And I think it would be done on the same basis as the gold, which is that they're priced by weight. <laughs> So you can kind of fatten them up for market, in a sense. <laughs> well, OK, now, I can understand that the, the concept behind cash for gold is that gold is just about the only thing that's retaining its value. What's the value of children? <laughs> I don't know, scrap value? There must be some. <laughs> Melt them down? I haven't really... Or possibly just employ them in more branches, more franchises of cash for kids. It's a kind of... It's a strange sort of pyramid scheme that just carries on, <laughs> carries on growing virally. So without ever like being, a child without ever being financially viable. Yeah. Right, OK. So Aren't you basically talking effort. about lazy surrogacy, where people have the children and then find the buyer later? Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it like that. There yeah. may be oversupply, actually, on that basis, mightn't there? Is there a cut-off point? Could you just give them cash for people? <laughs> I mean, could you just lead confused people there and just dress, dress as you a young to, boy? There's obviously got to be some legal parameters. You've got to prove ownership, I think. <laughs> This is a monstrous and ill-thought-out scheme. It's just basically people farming or something. What do you do? Do you make them clean chimneys? Do you? I mean, what sort of possible motive do you have for collecting this that, many that, children, you animal? That's not my part of the business. This, this sounds like a, like a Madonna interview, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the perfect question in a Madonna interview. <laughs> uh, Frank... Uh, Mr. Frank Skinner, what's your idea for a terrible chain of shops? Well, I'm thinking mine's starting to sound quite sweet. <laughs> I was in odd bins and uh, it struck me that I don't like this way that alcohol says things like please drink wisely and stuff like that. I find it very hypocritical. So I, I thought I could have a shop called Odd Binge, <laughs> which acknowledges the fact that binge drinking is a very, very popular thing. So I'd obviously have cop price alcohol. I mean, really cop price. I mean, <laughs> some, free. some free stuff. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, you know, to good customers. And, um, and then <laughs> a, a whole load of accessories for the binge drinker. I was thinking you could hire out guide dogs for the blind drunk. <laughs> That's so it's just, it's just goods for very, very drunk people. It's, yeah, it's so, brilliant so the guide idea. dogs would take them home. They'd, they'd drag them, if absolutely <laughs> necessary. And then I had this idea for sort of heavy-duty, five-inch false eyelashes so that women don't break their noses when they fall flat on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> what, they're sort of falling yeah, they're, yeah, well, they're, they're, they're sort of stop you going all the way, yeah. They're, right. They're, yeah. <laughs> you can make recordings of, like, someone going like... Whoa, 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 like, for if they were particularly shy but they wanted to live the part, just play it behind them. Yeah. <laughs> and they just have to, like... <laughs> Mine. <laughs> what, yes, a I'm shirt helping. for shy drunks that shouts abuse on your behalf? Yeah. <laughs> I remember getting drunk once and just shopping online and ordering books I didn't want. And so it, it was like they'd turn up, it was like a drunk Santa had come <laughs> a few days later. They just brought me sort of books. I just didn't have any, you know, the history of the helicopter or something like this. <laughs> it struck me as interesting at 2am. Yeah. And, and so I think you could just sell... You could just sell painted eggs to drunks, couldn't you? Maybe the secret is free drink and then expensive other stuff. <laughs> yeah, just stuff that looks useful, sort of a funny hat or, a, well, an orange hat, maybe. Yeah. Um, Come to uh, think of it, that's where I got that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's a, a spin-off of that, of doing a kind of uh, drunks dress hire shop. I'm always impressed by the drunks that are sort of on a green at about 10 o'clock in the morning, suit and tie. 
I think, well, maybe there should be somewhere for them. No, I think what you've got business. there, I've always thought this, that, that, that tramps don't start off looking like tramps. There is a period where they're quite smartly dressed and clean. <laughs> Debonair. And if, and if you see one then, you think exactly that. You think, what is that rather smartly dressed man doing, living such a lifestyle? But he, he's just in training. He's an apprentice. <laughs> OK, so, well, of your schemes, of your schemes, Josie, you had reverse Argos. Which it's getting, was... looking better now, isn't it? <laughs> looking more Frankly, yes, in retrospect, now it's a work of genius. Um, Dan, your monstrous cast for children kind of policy. Um, and Frank, odd binge. Uh, I'm going to give the points to Frank for odd Hurrah. binge. OK, moving on. This round is called This Putrid Modern Hell. Uh, I'll be asking each of my guests to nominate the thing they hate most about modern life. By modern, I mean any point after the advent of John Barrowman, uh, very much what I like to think of as the post-Barrowman era. Uh, my favourite answer wins a point. Language has changed a lot uh, in modern times. If a 19th century farmer turned up today, you'd have to explain that an orange is now for making calls on, a blackberry is for emails, and an apple is for pretending to write a screenplay on in Starbucks. <laughs> The vision of the future as promised in the movies has never really materialised. The closest we've got to robots we can make love to is trying to plug a USB stick in in the dark. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> that is quite sexual, actually, when you're doing that. Um, and as for Back to the Future... It is! It's as tender as I get. Um, and as for Back to the Future, the closest we've got to travelling through time is watching Back to the Future on ITV2 plus one. <laughs> which is genuinely a confusing experience. <laughs> Technology has transformed entertainment. I used to have a tiny 14-inch screen on which I watched darts. Now I've got a 42-inch HD LED 3D TV with an integrated Blu-ray player, seven speaker surround sound and a subwoofer on which I watch darts. <laughs> Dan, what annoys you most about the modern world? Calorific information on food packaging. I try uh, and watch my weight a bit, right? And supermarkets want to make it as confusing and difficult as possible, right? You know you get food packaging and it has a little wheel on which has calories, salt, sugar, fat. So you, you pick up a microwave meal and say, ooh, calories 360 or something. Well, fair enough, I'll have that for my tea. Then you get it home and then you see the small print that says, a third of a pack contains. <laughs> That's purely there to trick me. <laughs> So not only is it misleading, it's also slightly judgmental. I think, it's a nice spaghetti carbonara. What's that, 480 calories? Oh, that's fine. Then I'll see a half a pack contains. Right, and the subtext of that is, of course, well, you're obviously not going to eat the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> what human being could possibly consume this whole packet? You fat sod. <laughs> I found one a couple of days ago. I had a look. The first thing I picked up when I went to the supermarket was uh, onion bargees. Right, a little thing of six onion bargees. Right, sort of golf ball size. It said 180 calories. And again, I thought, oh, great. And then I saw two bargees contain. Why? How do they know I'm inviting two pals around for a bargee party? <laughs> <laughs> Only two each, lads. Let's not go crazy. <laughs> so it infuriated. So but... I see it as a chance for some on-the-spot maths. And that's really exciting to me. Like, I, I really enjoy that. Like, if you get a thing of figs and it will say 200 grams... Uh, a serving, 20 grams, contains this many calories, and you're thinking, well, I'm going to have to find out what a tenth of this pack is and then multiply that by the ratio that I think I would eat, and then... Yeah, you see, I've left, I've left school. <laughs> <laughs> I've, 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 I've grown school it now, and I'm going to go shopping on my own. I don't have to worry about maths. You've made it sound like a round on countdown. <laughs> My tip for losing weight, well, I don't have any great tips for losing weight, but Will I would this say... this be on your new DVD? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, um, my tip for losing weight is just... I've, got, uh, I've had this idea that I do want to genuinely bring out, which is just plates with harrowing scenes printed on them. <laughs> so the more you eat, the more of the harrowing scene. <laughs> and you'll... Your appetite will die away. Photographs, <laughs> photographs of shut-ins. Yeah, just photographs of terrible, terrible events from world history that you, don't, you feel a bit bad for eating off. <laughs> <laughs> Who would buy that? <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's eight the people. The trouble is with that is if, if you were eating steak tartare, you wouldn't know when you'd got down to the horrible scene. <laughs> <laughs> sticking with you, Frank, sticking with you, what is... <laughs> 
<laughs> what is the thing that appalls you most about modernity in general? Well, I really hate, and this is not something I've had to make up for comic effect, it's completely from the heart, I really hate that luggage on wheels. I very much believe if you can't carry it, don't pack it. <laughs> And I think it ceases to be luggage when you put wheels on it. It becomes a vehicle. <laughs> and I don't think you should be allowed to take a vehicle onto a plane. But well, hang on a minute. I just think you're being unreasonable, because it took mankind quite a long time to sort of come up with the idea of wheels on luggage. Yeah, why do you think that was? Why did we go for centuries with suitcases without wheels? Why is it only now Because we had valets. <laughs> no, but I don't think most people did, did they? What's so bad about what's wrong with? Well, I'll give you an impression. Man walking behind you, carrying a suitcase. <sighs> OK. Right. OK, man question. behind you with suitcase on wheels. <laughs> what, is he beatboxing? <laughs> I hate it. At first, I thought, well, maybe they've had to carry so much stuff that they've had to put wheels on that. It's, it's uncarryable. But then you see little mm. tiny things on wheels. And it's not about the weight anymore. It's just about the wheels. It's the most important. And people are so proud that there's a telescopic handle on it. They stand there and go, look, no handle, quite long handle. Where did that come from? <laughs> like, it's, like, like it's a clown pulling a bunch of flowers out of his pocket. <laughs> And it, you, you, I mean, you introduced all of that by saying you genuinely hate yes. this. this. That's a lot of hate to carry around for something so innocuous, I would Well, at thought. least I mean, I'm carrying it around. I don't have it on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> well, I find this... I, I just think you're intolerant. I'm no. disgusted by your intolerance. Can, can I just establish that I've been called intolerant by Charlie Brooker? <laughs> <laughs> that's but, quite a moment. <laughs> But I, li I quite I like the I sound they make. I like that No, rumbling. you can't no. possibly like that That's sound. It's like really good. If you're walking and you speed up your walking, it gets higher pitched. And then, so you can have, like, a little fun. No, what? <laughs> different surfaces. You get different sounds yes, from different do. surfaces oh, as well. Dog. If you what go you people people need cobbles a, to You need tarmac. a dog. <laughs> people just pull one of the little suitcase around instead of a lovely, warm companion. You can't make your dog eat all of your holiday clothes. <laughs> Do you know what? I can't stop him. <laughs> I, I quite like... There should be a sort of ramp in the airport where you can just climb on top of your luggage and just wheel yourself along on it. Oh, that's what I've always wanted to do. That's what children do. You know, the children's... Isn't that a segue? I think that's already been invented, isn't it? <laughs> can I say, I was driving over Lambeth Bridge in, in, in London, a, a large conurbation in the south-east of England, <laughs> and I saw a man on a segue coming over the bridge, and I thought to myself, how big a prat is it possible to look <laughs> than this bloke? And when he got very close, it was Lembit Opic. <laughs> so, OK, so, so, Frank, you're disgusted by the, the concept of wheeled luggage. Josie, what annoys you most about the modern world? Um, <laughs> the thing that um, I really hate is the fact that you can comment on things on the internet. I can't remember who described it as the bottom half of the internet, but that's, somebody <laughs> described sediment. it thus. But it is, it's like nothing is allowed any window of joy. Like, you go on YouTube and someone puts up a picture of their cat and it's called, My Beautiful Cat, and then all the comments are like, This cat should die! <laughs> I hate this cat! <laughs> oh, typical Zionist cat! <laughs> <laughs> Like, that kind of thing. And you just think, like, paint your bathroom. <laughs> or, like, buy a harmonica. Or just do anything. But this is not the forum you think it is. Like, I think people think of the word forum and they think of, like, classical history where people would kind of sit debating important things. And that is not what internet forums are. <laughs> They're, like, I'd like magnets. I ancient Rome was exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> people would be like, shut up! I will find your house! <laughs> I bet it was. I think we are, we're only left with the greatest hits from the <laughs> Roman Forum, but there's a lot of rubbish that got cut out. <laughs> well, so it's just the, the fact that it's just unfettered negativity, because yeah. you've made it sound appealing to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
can I say that I, I agree with that? Because this is absolutely <laughs> true. Last week, someone said to me, oh, there's a really nice thing about you on one of the Guardian blogs, and I never read reviews. And they said, no, honestly, it's wholly positive. And I went to it, and it was, it was nice. And I just accidentally scrolled down a bit, and the first comment said, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> and it ruined the whole thing for me. <laughs> oh. You know what? I'm going to say... I'm going to, I'm going to give the point to Josie. Ha! <laughs> Uh, and so, in our final round, I'll be asking my guests a series of quick-fire questions. As ever, the wrongest answer to each one wins a point. So we'll start with, what is the worst way to answer a phone call? Um, going, bye then. That's <laughs> <laughs> quite sweet. It's the opposite of what you say when you pick up the phone. <laughs> I like it when, when the phone goes off mid-conversation and someone phones me back, they always say, I don't know what happened then. <laughs> And I always say, well, how could you? In order to know what happened then, you'd need some sort of access to the whole network. <laughs> you'd need to be in front of some massive blue computer screen pointing out the, the best locations for mobile. We'll, we'll never know what happened then. <laughs> Get over it. I have done that about ten times. <laughs> Can I say it went a lot better here than it ever goes on the phone? I like it when you see when you, you witness somebody else's phone call getting cut off, like somebody going into a tunnel or something on a train, and then they have to sort of style it out slightly to not look embarrassed at the other. Yeah. Because they'll do about five seconds of talking where you realise there's nobody else on the other end of the line. <laughs> and then they don't want anybody else to see, so it's just they try and get a soft landing out of it somehow. <laughs> 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 You've been on public, in public having a conversation with somebody on the phone, like a bit of an argument and you're trying not to let the people in public know that you're having an argument and they hang up on you and you continue to hold a conversation with the air. Have you ever done that? No. I've, <laughs> I've done that and said, OK, well, that, I'm glad that's all cleared up. <laughs> OK, yeah, I love you too. See you later. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Sometimes it goes on for hours. Um, I was doing that once and then the phone rang while I was on, <laughs> which was... Utterly humiliating. <laughs> uh, I think, Frank, you get a point for that. <clears throat> and that noise means we've reached the end of the show. What a tragedy. <laughs> uh, Frank has won. Oh. Congratulations, Frank. Commiserations to the rest of you. That's all for tonight. Now go away. <laughs>